This is the video podcast for Chapter 16 of Field Methods in Hydrology on the topic of subsurface characterization and sampling. We have to worry a lot about the subsurface because there's a lot of water moving through the ground, and so we need to know about the properties of the medium that the water is moving through, as well as to be able to sample that water and assess its chemistry and other attributes of it. Now, subsurface sampling is a pretty large area because there's lots and lots of different approaches. And sometimes, to me, this presentation feels somewhat like a laundry list of technologies. And maybe there's some ability to just look these up later on, but the purpose of a field methods class is to give you an introduction to all these different types of approaches of doing things, from the very simple, low-cost approach to the most sophisticated, expensive you know, approaches, substituting labor for capital and back and forth. Um, and then you, know, you can try to figure out later, depending on where your career goes, what you're going to use. In addition to talking about making holes to collect sediments, we also need to be able to make holes to have holes, which are what we call wells. So these are the two main topics of this video podcast, and there really isn't a good place to divide this into two, so I'm just going to run this as one long presentation. Scientific reasons to sample the subsurface. Sometimes, simply as geoscientists, we want to characterize the stratigraphy and lithology of the material in the subsurface. If we're trying to understand the depositional processes that resulted in that sediment filling in, or trying to understand the geology of hard rocks that may exist somewhere that are sedimentary rocks who, that were formed by processes like we see today, those are some of the geological reasons. We may be interested in the hydraulic properties of that material because we are doing modeling and so we might need to know um, initial moisture content or bulk density. There's also specific parameter estimation, so not just inputs to models, but the parameters of models, which could be like hydraulic conductivity and storativity. Um, geotechnical evaluation, is this material safe for us to build a road on, or do we have to worry about landsliding, uh, or earth movements, or, or anything like that, uh, earthquakes. Geochemical sampling for characterizing the sediment itself, like its bulk chemistry or isotopic composition, or the pore water, because we may be wanting to figure out the groundwater age, or just the chemistry or water quality, um, you know, the effects of agriculture or urban land uses on what's happening in the groundwater zone. Depending on how you answer all of these kinds of questions, as well as the setting within which you're going to collect these samples, <clears throat> there are a lot of different ways of going about collecting materials, and so that's what we're going to cover in this, this presentation. And I'd say more than some of the others, this presentation is just all about methods, so I'm just going to give you a long list of different technologies for you to think about. Now, what kind of samples do you want to have out of this? Here are four different types that you can get. A composite sample is a sample that's a mix of all the stuff through all the depths that you collect while you're boring. A grab sample, just like it would be in a lake or on a, <coughs> on a, the, a riverbed, is just one point-based sample that you're grabbing and then <coughs> seeing what's happening at that location. Cuttings are samples that you get from something that has a very aggressive drilling approach that just is grinding everything up, cutting it up. And then a core is a continuous undisturbed cylinder of sediment that you can collect and that would be the highest quality gold standard kind of sample to get in order to see all the details of what's happening in the different layers of the material. Three major steps in subsurface sediment collection. Of course, as always, before you go out or after some initial test sampling, developing an experimental design. So where are you going to sample? Uh, how many sites are you going to sample? And what methods are you going to use in light of the, the setting that you're in? Getting ready for a field excursion is always really important. Um, you may have seen from our field trip to the Schubert watershed, thinking through how you're going to label something is, is actually more complicated than you think. And when you're drilling, you know, how many sites do you have to drill? How are you going to name all of those sites? 
what's your numbering system, having really good permanent markers for, for that, um, having sheets that are pre prepared and ready to record data associated with different samples. So getting all that figured out, as well as testing and maintaining all of the mechanical equipment that you need. Um, going to the site, um, you know, is the site a forest? Is it a wetland? Is it right on a road? Is it private property, public property? Do you need permits? Just all of that aspect of getting ready. I just wanted to give a little bit of this preliminary information because it's important to think through all this as well. And then on the back end, knowing, okay, how am I going to permanently store or archive these samples if I'm going to at all? Do I need refrigerators or freezers? Um, how big and, and so forth. Okay, we're going to look at manual sampling methods <clears throat> and then really large machine, you know, mechanical devices or gas powered devices. So there's a whole bunch of manual soil sampling methods down to different depths. The advantages of these manual approaches is portability. If you need to get into a natural setting like a wetland or a forest, you're not going to be able to drive a drilling rig through there without causing vast destruction. So having uh, the ability to get into to remote places can be important. Cost is always a factor. And then finally, of course, we just want to have a low impact on the environment. So you know, you're going to be collecting a, a core sample, um, but, but being the lightest touch that you can be is important. The, the downside is that these are methods that are really honestly mostly like less than two meters depth, six feet or so. But, you know, in the best scenarios of like a really um, nice mud that's kind of almost like a butter, um, you might be able to go as much as seven meters, but that's relatively rare. <clears throat> Manual methods are not going to allow you to collect cobbles unless you're just doing a shovel, basically. And they're going to require more physical labor, labor in order to collect them, and especially to remove things out of the ground. There's three broad types, bulk samplers, auger samplers, and two type samplers or cores. And I'm going to work through all the different kinds that are shown here. Of course, we can always just start with a shovel, right? Always start with the simplest uh, technology. You can always dig a hole with a shovel, spade, or pickaxe. The problem with this, of course, is you're getting a fairly disturbed sample. It's very hard to control the size of the hole, particularly the diameter. If you only want to you know, uh, have a small diameter and not have much of an impact on the environment, then a shovel isn't, isn't good. But of course, if you just need the top 10, 20 centimeters, um, this can be a very convenient way to get a composite sample of that material. Uh, you know, I've always wondered, how do you dig a well? You know, you see, you see a, a classic medieval well or something like that. How is that done? And what they actually did was you would make a cement ring um, and then put that on the ground, dig out, and as that digs out, then um, the ring is going to sink until it's flush with the ground surface. Now, make another cement ring on top of that, of the same, same diameter and thickness and all. Put it right on top, and then dig down another section. And as you dig down, then the ring will be settling down. So you just, you know, this ring is sort of incrementally going down, but you're layering on top of it ring upon ring upon ring. And so... You're advancing down, but you're just at the surface. You only have one ring exposed at the top, and you're basically working your way down. So what's nice about this is it shows the idea of sampling in relation to making a hole and keeping the hole open as important elements that are really independent. This kind of well can only be dug so far, you know, a lot, a lot deeper than you could go if you didn't maintain the hole. And so this is a really important when you're collecting samples, being really mindful of what's spilling off the wall versus what you're collecting as fresh material and deciding if you need uh, an outer casing in order to hold the area open. <clears throat> the next step up is called a hand auger. So a hand auger is uh, a rod with a T-bar on it, and then you're kind of turning that like a giant screwdriver or something, you're turning that, and that twisting motion torques so that you get a, a digging effect. 
Um, and I'm just going to quickly go ahead. So here's like a T-bar here. And then um, for this top handle, you can attach on many different rods. There are additional rod segments shown here. Sometimes these are screwed together. Sometimes they're bolted together. This is a bolting kind. And then at the bottom, you have a variety of choices about what the actual tool is that's doing the digging. So I'll, I'll come back to that. The type of tool you use is going to depend on the texture and whether the material is consolidated or not. Um, so you're basically just using this twisting motion. And again, you know, honestly, you're going to go about six feet, you know, two meters or so in most cases. And in fact, that's the typical depth that uh, soil surveys are done to. In ideal conditions, you might be able to go quite a bit deeper than that, but I just don't. I've tried, believe me, I've tried, but the longer those rods get, you're providing a twisting motion and you're trying to have that go like 15, 20 feet down. That's really, really hard to do without breaking all of these pieces. The main advantage of, well, let's, let's come back to that. So here's a variety of augering tools. The far left, it's basically just like a drill. This is for a case where you have a hard pan, so you really have to just break through that and you're not going to be collecting much of a sample with something that looks like a drill bit. This one is a case where, where you have clay, um, but it, so it's very cohesive material that's going to hold itself together, but it's not that hard, so it doesn't take that much work to punch through. And so here, each time you turn, you're making a horizontal cut more than a vertical cut. So you, you, know, you push this through, the stuff might ooze around it like jello, and then you're cutting around. And um, the cylinder in the middle is going to remain intact because it's a cohesive material, so then you can just pull that out. Um, this one actually is sealed at the bottom. It's, just, it's basically just something that you're pushing on with, with a flat piece in order to smooth out the bottom of a hole. Uh, in the middle here would be your standard, you know, mixed textured sediment. Um, so it, it's a relatively wide diameter. It's a more open. You can see the big cutting bit on it. And as you're turning this, it's doing the cutting. The material goes in here, but it's going to tend to not fall out when you pull the whole auger out because it's got a mix of material, like enough clay to help hold things together or moisture to hold it together. Um, on the far right is this one that looks very similar, but actually the cutting part here is much closer together. And what that does is it forces, well, it just holds material in place. So if you have very, um, you know, non-cohesive sand that's just going to want to fall out, then this smaller bucket is going to have the ability to hold it as you're retrieving the material. The one between those two is for a more cohesive kind of material where it's not so loose that it's just going to hold together like the second one from the left, um, but it's cohesive enough so you want to have an open window. And the worst is if you just go out with a general regular auger and you pull this thing out and it's just compacted in there, and then you have to take like a screwdriver or knife and jam it in there and kind of like dig out of the bucket. It can make it take a lot longer. So having the right tool for the setting or having a, a complete set so you can switch as you hit different layers is going to be pretty important. The main advantages here, lightweight, versatile, cheap, easy. You can access pretty much anywhere that you can pack this thing in. Um, you're getting sequential samples, so you're, you can collect the whole uh, way down. It's just that each set of, you know, say, uh, you know, you know, less, you know, I don't know, 10 centimeter vertical sample. It's basically a composite of that. It's pretty hard to subsample within there. Um, maybe, maybe if you have this very cohesive material, you might have some preservation. But you have smearing of material along the sides and as you're going up and down. So it's it's not a clean sample. Another thing too is just pulling this out. You know, like pulling this out, it really hurts your back after a while. So if you had to do lots and lots of augering, you have to be very physically fit and take appropriate precautions for your, your health and safety. Soil syringe is a very small sampler. As you can see, you're pushing it into the ground and pulling it out with the help of the, the suction from the plunger. 
Also, if you have a soil core, this could be used as a way to subsample in the core to, to extract out a relatively precise interval along the core. Um, the next step up, instead of having a plunger, just a direct push of a tube. So a single tube, you can see it's open here. You might have a plastic liner, like a very thin liner inside here. So you're not touching the metal wall and you can just pull that liner out and have a really nice intact sample. Or there might not be any liner and you're just digging it out of here. Uh, root zone soil profile sampler, so relatively similar to the last one. It's a direct push technology, only getting the top of the soil profile. But now instead of a round sample, it's a thin rectangular slice so you can see more of the cross-sectional composition of the material. Hammerhead cross-handle core. Okay, this is a direct push technology, but it's for material where you can't just push in very easily, and here is a small sledgehammer that you can use to hammer on this top. You may also get a full-size sledgehammer and, and really pound away at that. Um, so that means that this has to be very strong you know, nickel or, or steel so that it can handle the blows that are going to push on that. You also need very good ear protection, possibly even double ear protection and gloves. And you have to be very careful because both at the top and the bottom, there can be metal shavings that can really uh, cut you up if you're not careful. Also, you can see the really small diameter of this tube. That, you know, having a very small diameter means that disproportionately more of the material is in contact with the, the inside of that tube rather than in the undisturbed area in the middle. And just like how a river um, has the highest velocity in the middle and the lowest velocity along the sides, well there's friction here too. So as the tube is going down, um, the material may not go up into the tube as well along the sides. The bigger the diameter is, the more the material isn't touching and is going to go in better. The next step up in technology from this just simple direct hit is to put a contraption around this and change from a sledgehammer to a slide hammer and that's shown here with the, the JMC environmentalist subsoil probe. I'm going to jump down to the picture here. So what we have here is a casing where it's a, this, this big structure here and then in the middle of that is the tube that's going to be collecting the sample in it. That's a three foot or four foot long tube and um, what we're going to do is we're going to put this plug, this metal plug, right into the, sit that on top of the tube. And then you can see there's a rod and uh, then there's another big tube on the outside. Well this big tube actually has an inner hole and it's sliding up and down on this inner rod. So this inner rod, it's like a guide that helps the outer tube to go straight up and down. And so you pretty much are just pounding on this. Notice that this person it doesn't appear to have much ear protection, but they really need not only just little ear plugs, but also big earmuff plugs um, on top of that, as well as the hard hat. And it's very important with your hands to um, you know not get pinched between the big, uh, this is how far this has to, to come in contact with this outer casing. So there's a long way to push down. Uh, then, one, so you're collecting the core as you go down. There's a liner inside the tube. And then um, you can see that there's this arm that he's using as like a foot jack to dig this whole thing out. So the foot jack, uh, it's, it's like it, it grabs the, the tube. And when you push your foot down, it pulls it up a little bit. Then you spring it back up again. It kind of let go. Go down, grab, I'm like, go, grab, pull it up, open, slide down, grab, pull up, open. And so it's doing that, that kind of motion over and over again with each time you, you use your foot. Um, so with this device, it's about $2,000 to $2,500. Really good for unconsolidated material. You know, you can, you can get two to three meters easily. After that, it's just going to depend on the soil type. Um, 
0.8 inch or 1.2 inch diameter. I'm always a big fan of getting the biggest diameter you can for the reasons I already described about having material go through the tube. Land axis, one person operable. These are all the benefits of manual methods. Um, some amount of smearing and sample disturbance, but it is continuous. It's not intended to be used for wetland saturated conditions or a lot of mud. And it can be, you know, it's soft and it can't be too hard. If it's just right, that hammer will allow you to push in but not be so loose, then you're in the right place where this is going to work. Um, with all this hammering, all the parts are just getting worked over time. And so it's the kind of technology where parts are going to wear out and need to be replaced. And you know, it's good to have a machine shop around to keep things sharp and, and functional. Okay, the next tech technology is really my favorite. It's just, it's the most bizarre thing, um, but it, when you see what it does, it's really cool and thinks differently. Most technologies are technologies in which you're pushing down and you're collecting a core while you're pushing down. This is a totally different animal. This is a device where you're in wetland mud where it's really easy to push down. There's actually a plug as you're pushing down, so you're not collecting anything. You're just pushing your way through the material. And when you get to the depth that you want, you then do a rotation that collects the sample. So let me show you how this works. So in the middle of this slide is the Russian peat borer. At the bottom is a big point that is a plug. So this is allowing you to push through the muck without collecting it. Above that is a hollow tube, and off to the side is a plate. If we look at this in cross-section at the top, what you can see is um, the empty tube and then this plate. You push it down, and there's no collection being done because the bottom is blocked. When you, once you're down to the depth you want to go to, you turn the handle. When you turn the handle, it has a mechanism that allows the tube to rotate around the plate. And you can see that in this sequential series of images. It's while you're turning that you're collecting the core. And so it does a full 180 degree rotation, and now you've collected the core. Now you can pull it out. When you get it out, you lay it down on the ground, you turn the handle again, and you expose the sediment, which you could either then slice right there or you can um, take the whole thing and transfer it to another tube or saran wrap or something for preservation. So the brilliant thing about this is you're getting no compaction or while you're pushing down because you're not even collecting the material. Like the, the pushing down material is here and the collecting material is on the other side. And here's an example of, of what a, uh, a Russian peat bore sample looks like. And you can just see coming straight out of the ground all the different layers that are evident in, in that material. And, and you can really see that there's no sliding that took place in the collection of that sample. Um, th this is designed to collect half a meter or I think one meter samples, but, but the half meter is really good size. And you just push it down. so. You can collect a surface sample, then you push down half a meter, collect another sample, push down a meter and a half, collect another sample. You usually, you don't have to go back into the same hole, although you can, um, but it's basically you just go down to whatever depth you want and you'll get a half a meter to meter long continuous undisturbed sample. The main limit again is it requires cohesive sediment and I think this is like $1,500 to $2,000 depending on where you buy it. I think with the surface sample collection, I mentioned this already, like if you're on the bed of a river, lake, estuary, or ocean, you can use a gravity core. So you're basically just dropping a heavy weight on a, along a string, and at the bottom of that, um, you have a core barrel, so it just, just plunges in. There's some fins here to keep this pointed straight down. Um, and this can be facilitated with something called a piston. So I want to take a minute and explain a piston because a piston is very important for collecting um, saturated or loose sediments. 
Remember I was talking about for the water sampling in a lake, the old fast food restaurants draw trick where you put your thumb at the top of the straw and pull it out, and let go, put it in your mouth. Okay, you're using the suction uh, of, the, of, water, uh, of the fluid trying to get out of the straw. Uh, it creates that suction between your thumb and the fluid that holds it in place. We'd like to do something like that because when you're pushing a tube down, you know, in theory, you're like you're you're like a, a circular knife or like a, a cylindrical knife cutting through the material. But the reality is, there's a lot of disturbance between that knife and the material. Instead of having just a you know an atmospheric pressure and then pushing around it, it helps if you can apply a suction inside the tube to literally be pulling the sediment up while the tube is going down to help maintain um, a good flow of sediment in the tube. To do that, instead of just having your thumb on the straw, imagine you could stick your thumb all the way down in the straw to the very bottom of it and have it sticking out the bottom. That's what this picture shows. This shows like a person's thumb, imagine, but being replaced with a rubber stopper, being pushed from the top of the straw down to the bottom, and it's right inside there. And then we have this metal cable here so that we're going to be able to pull that up through as the, the tube goes down, this is effectively coming up and we're creating a suction. So the goal is to have this rubber stopper pretty much just stay at the ground surface. The tube will go down around it, but that will effectively make it um, be at a higher position along the tube and that, again, that creates a nice suction. So in order for this to work, while one or two people are working on pushing the, the core down, another person has to be holding this tight to keep the suction in there. And so we use this term, a plunger, a rubber stopper, that fits in there, tight, you know, pressure fit, and, and that's how it works. Um, this is used like in a, in a gravity core case. So you have a, here's a, a case with, we, this is going to hit the ground, that's going to create a release, then this is going to drop, and so our main uh, piston core is going to go down, and as that goes down, the line to the piston is going to become taut at the ground, and then it's going to create that suction effect to pull the sediment up in there. So this is, this is basically the line for the piston, um, and then this helps to trigger when it should release. Okay, another technology that's going to take advantage of uh, a piston but is for collecting terrestrial sediments, like especially in a wetland that is or has a lot of organic matter or at least mud, so not a lot of sand and gravel or anything like that. You can take an aluminum or thick-walled plastic tube at, and um, you know just have that tube, and then you need to make a T-bar for it of some kind. And then um, what we're going to do is we're going to take that and instead of like hammering it down or using a slide hammer or anything like that, all we're going to have to do is just vibrate the heck out of this thing and the vibrations will cause the saturated material to liquefy in the immediate vicinity of the core barrel which will allow the tube to go down like a hot knife through butter. And here are some photos to illustrate this. Um, so there's a device called a, a, a concrete vibrator. It's basically just a two-stroke or four-stroke gasoline engine that just um, has a metal bar you know, moving at incredibly fast speed to create a vibration of a metal rod at the end of this um, flexible metal line. So typically, a uh, concrete vibrator is used to put into concrete that's been poured to make sure it's all flat. So it's, you know, it's equilibrated, like it's moved like a fluid and isn't too viscous and taking an unusual shape. So what we're doing is we're taking that, that vibrating head and we're, we're using these metal plates to bolt it to a tube. You can see it in this photo on the left. The, the, it's a pretty large vibrating head and it's got this uh, orthogonal joint here um, where it's also clasped onto uh, a three inch diameter aluminum irrigation pipe, which is an empty tube. Um, here's another example of it with a plastic tube and you can see the plunger line 
for the for the piston sticking out of it. Um, you could also see in this middle photo this large T-bar that's been bolted on. It's separate from the, the vibration, but it allows you to either you know, push down on it with one person either side or even to stand on it and jump up and down on it. So the vibrating mechanism in very non-cohesive material and peat is going to allow this to just go down. Like You, you basically just pull this and it just, it just goes down really easily. But if you're in, you know, you hit a sand lens, you may need to add some actual um, hammering motion in addition to the vibration. The vibration too here, it's not like a massager. I mean, when you hold something with this vibration, it's like you almost are at the edge of losing control of all of your muscles and bones. You just feel everything sort of liquefying in your body is how it feels. Um, but it works very well. Uh, there's a fair number of parts, it's fairly heavy. So it is technically portable. We can put it in a canoe and paddle it around or you, know, you can get it around. It, it, they also can be mounted on a wheelbarrow or something like that. Um, but it's just not quite as easy as, as getting an auger somewhere. Okay, we're gonna shift gears now from the manual methods to the big, the big devices. Um, the drilling rigs, and we're going to divide them into small rigs and large rigs, as you'll you'll see how that works in a few moments. Um, but you can see, like I'm just pounding out a long list. Like, how are you going to learn all of these crazy different ways of coring? And I don't really have a good answer for it, but I need to show you and expose you to all of these different things. So we will play with these um, on field trips in the lab. You'll be able to see these, so it won't be just all lecture-based, but you know that's why we do this as a field course. So the small drilling rigs come into two types. The first is a direct push. We're basically substituting you know, the human's ability to push or hammer with hydraulic or mechanical force to do that. Um, or we have separately an augering, so basically drilling into the ground um, and you know, basically drilling a hole versus pushing a, pushing one. So the direct push usually is going to use a hydraulic mechanism to push, but it also could use a rapid mechanical hammer, which could be weight-based sort of device, you know, lifting and dropping a hammer or a vibrating component. But essentially, to push that barrel into the ground, this is going to give you a core that's going to be larger diameter, like a two-inch diameter, maybe one and a quarter, but but my preference is like two inch. Um, so that's a substantially better deal. You're gonna put a liner inside this because these core tubes are you know, big metal. Um, they can have sharps after being pounded on. Um, so we, we put a nice plastic liner in there or the barrel itself, these tubes, the metal may be um, open like a, like a door and they open into two uh, hemispheres and so that's called a split barrel sampler. I'll show you some photos in a moment. Powered mechanical auger is basically just a giant you know gas powered engine that's going to be rotating a giant drill as that's drilling down with the appropriate augering head then the cuttings are going to be coming up so you're not getting a core sample you're, you're getting um, an augering you could have a solid bit that's just chewing chewing things up and giving you those cuttings or you could have a core barrel surrounded by a drill and so you're you know you're you're rotating down to to cut open but you're collecting a sample into the middle of it these are going to go down to substantially greater depths and you know an order of magnitude more than just manual methods but as you go down each step that you go down, like every you know three, four foot sample you do, it takes you longer time to go down and up. Um, going down not so hard, but you have to add more and more sections of tubes and rods, so it takes a much longer time to go to 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 be ready to take a sample. Also, once you get below the water table, the process changes some because you have to balance the pressure um, associated with being below the water table. Okay, so here's an example of a relatively low cost trailer mounted Giddings device. Um, you know, you would basically be putting this behind a truck, driving it to the location, 
you know, pushing it off onto a farm field or the side of the road or whatever it is. And this generator is going to be used. There might be a direct push technology or there also could be a rotary auger. The challenge with this kind of device, though, is that they are very dangerous. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you could easily, if you get, get any of your body part in the wrong place, it could be ripped off or, or pushed through or whatever. So this is where safety just becomes paramount. So if we, if we go up from 30,000 to 70,000, we can get to a really elegant piece of machinery um, by a company called the Geoprobe. So now you know, we have a track-mounted motorized system, so we can literally drive this to where we want. It has footings in the back and the front. Um, it has this, um, this, the drilling stand, it rotates to be flat across, and then it, and then it rotates up into the vertical position. Um, this part here that says GH60 hammer, the core barrel goes under that, and you know you're applying a huge amount of power in order to push this down. And here's some photos. We we have a drilling rig, a geoprobe in our department, and I used it to collect uh, samples up to 15 meters depth in different floodplain settings. Um, so you can see that we're putting the casing underneath this bit. And then once it's there, then you lower it down and you just push and it just goes down. So uh, here's my, my former postdoc at the controls of the, you know, pushing it down. Notice he's wearing ear protection, um, preferably also hard hat setting as well. <coughs> and, um, you know, this, yeah, so that's that. Now associated with this technology are the idea of dual tube or single tube coring. So far, everything we've looked at, you know, if I go back even to VibraCore, it's just a single tube. You push down, you get a sample, and you pull it out. Drilling rigs can be done that way as well. But they also have the ability to do something called dual tube coring. With dual tube coring, you have an outer casing and an inner sampler. Initially, the outer casing, so you have an outer casing, and then inside that is going to be a smaller diameter sampler. Those are going to be together, and they're going to go down at the same time with the first push. So you push down from the surface, say, four feet down into the ground, and you've collected a sample in the inner tube while the outer tube is making the hole. Then you leave the outer casing there, you pull out the inner tube, and now you have your hole. You take the plastic liner out of the sample tube. Then you put the sample tube back. Now, you add the next outer casing, and you'd like to go down, but what about the inner tube? Well, the outer casing always has to be an open tube because it's pushing down, and it's making like the well wall. But for the inner tube, you don't have to have tubes the whole way. Only the sample collection has to be a tube. After that, you can use solid rods, and we will see this again in the field station, so I know it's kind of hard to just hear this talked at you, so we'll look at it too. But it's basically solid rods with a tube on the bottom of it so the rods can push. So um, only the very bottom most section is a sample tube and then you put rods on the out inside and a, the big outer casing on the outside and you push that down together. You do your push, pull out the whole inner thing, get your sample, put the inner thing back, add another rod, add another outer casing and go down again. So it's all the time it takes to pull the inner stuff out and put in, you know, reset, and put it all in. You know, imagine when you're 50 feet down, you pull this up 25 feet. Well, when you pull this up 25 feet, what happens if you let go and you've got 25 feet of rod and the tube fall to the bottom of the hole, right? How are you going to get that out? So it's extremely important with this kind of drilling to um, use a very step-by-step -step, you know, textbook procedure with checklists and make sure you do everything without fail to be, to be safe. And of course, just the more you practice it, the more experience you get, then it becomes very reliable. Okay, now let's go to the, the, the big rigs. So there's two kinds of big rigs we're gonna look at. The first is mud rotary drilling, and then the second is gonna be wire line drilling. Mud rotary drilling is 
Um, what you typically may have, may have thought of, you know, if you just someone just said drilling rig, you know, you, you watch some, I don't know, movie about drilling into an asteroid or whatever. Uh, what, uh, what mud rotary drilling is where you have a big biting head like these shown here. And you're basically just pushing this down. And uh, as you're pushing it down, you're turning these teeth that are then chewing up the material. And then to get rid of the material, you have water or, or some kind of drilling fluid. It usually has chemicals in it as well. In this case, the drilling fluid is going in the outside of the well. And then you can see up here it says suction lifts cuttings up drill pipe. So it goes down, mixes with the cuttings, and then, and then there's suction that pulls it up the inside that goes over, and then it comes back up and cuttings settle into the bottom of this pit. So you're recycling the same fluid from the pit um, around and around, and then as the cuttings come out, you can grab them out uh, along the way and analyze them. Of course, these are highly disturbed and contaminated cuttings, but they can give you a feel of the texture. So if you want to make a drill log to see how is the sedimentary material changing with depth, then this would allow you to do that. And then the last technique, I believe, is wireline drilling. So with wireline drilling, this is very similar to the, to the dual tube approach that I already mentioned. It's just got a little wrinkle to it. Um, in this case, imagine that we're going to do a direct push sample from the surface um, with no outer casing at all. So here we're going to use a mechanical device called the wireline hammer. The wireline allows us to basically just go up and down. Just imagine you have a pulley and you like pull, 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 and you like lift a heavy weight up. Then you let go and you stand back and boom, this hammer goes down, smashes your core and pushes it right into the ground just the right amount. So from the surface, you push down and you collect the core. Now you've collected the core, now bring in your hollow auger and just start drilling that down, just chewing up the outer area around the sample. Drill down until you're flush with the inner sampler. Then keep that tube there and then pull up your tube again. Of course, you've already got your sample. Um, now put it down and so here we are now. So step one, we're right where I'm talking about. We've got the outer casing with the auger right there. We've, we've got a fresh core liner and, and outer, well, in inner core casing right flush to the ground. Now we pound on that. When we pound on that, we, collect, we, we push it the next step into the ground, we collect that sample, pull it out, okay, wireline recovery, and now you have that hole. Now you're going to advance this outer casing down by drilling it down. And as you're drilling, you're using drilling mud to flush all that material out to get down flush with that location. So that's a one-two step. The first step is collecting a sample, pulling it out, then the second step is drilling down with the hollow stem auger to advance the outer hole. And then you just repeat that. That's all the methods. Wow, that was a blast. I'm um, sure you got, you know, you're probably like, what? You know, it's a lot of stuff. But, okay, so once you have that material, what do you do with it? Well, you, if you have intact cores, you could take it over to your, your local doctor's office or your vet office and run x-rays or uh, you know cat scans whatever you want you can hit it with gamma rays to get the bulk density of the material you can take photographs of the digital cutter color um, some of that you can do without even taking it out of the core barrel other times you at least need to extrude it so so you have two choices if you have a liner whether it's a plastic liner or a metal tube you either have to cut that with like electrical scissors um, or you have to take the plunger like the piston and, and push it out. Uh, so that's called extruding it out. But when you extrude it with a push rather than cutting, then um, you know, you're smushing it some. So that's not so good. Um, my experience is that electrical shears work very, very well um, at, at opening things up. Once you've opened it, you might cut it in half to really get a nice clean view of what's going on in the middle you know, describing, photo photographing, documenting what you see, 
having someone who's taken a class in stratigraphy to characterize the, the sequence that's in there. Um, to process the core, you might then slice it into even intervals. Uh, you might do stratified sampling where you say, okay, I see a dark area here, then a light area here, or on the basis of texture, color, stratigraphy. You might use uneven sampling to um, break it up into different units. And uh, once you have each interval, then you can store that in a bag and freeze it. You know, usually you're going to take half the core and subsample it uh, in intervals and collect it, and then keep the other half protected. And if you have like an archival facility to, to or with a refrigerator to keep it in. Here's just some examples of varved lake sediments. Um, here's coastal marsh where you can see mud and then a big sand layer and then a whole bunch of mixed organic debris and mud again. Okay, so now we're going to switch from collecting the sediment to making a hole for the purpose of extracting water out, what we call a well. To make a well, you have to pick a location and think about that. You have to have a method of well construction. You're going to need to have a way of digging or drilling out the hole, and I've already covered that. You're then going to need to install the well, which is usually going to be like a, a metal or a plastic casing of some kind and the parts associated with that. Once you've built the thing, then you have to do what we call developing it, which is just helping it to be able to flow properly. And then you have to take steps to protect the water quality of the well. Here are the elements of a well you might have a two inch PVC pipe as the main liner. So you could imagine that however you dug the hole, like wire line drilling, let's say, or dual tube direct push with a geoprobe, you now have a hole, and so you could put a two inch diameter PVC pipe right into that hole. Once you've put it into the hole, then you're gonna pour something in here called a filter pack, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, the filter pack will hold it up um, and allow water to move freely through that area. You're going to then cover that outer area with then a cement or bentonite grout, and that needs to be the, quite substantial to prevent pollution from moving down from the surface. And then at the very top, there's going to be a concrete surface seal. The exposed casing that's there is going to need to have some way of protecting it, um, locking cover or a whole big case, um, so a whole, whole bunch of aspects like that. Okay, let's look at some of the unique elements of the well. The first is the screened interval that allows groundwater to go through. So here is a cross-section of the ground. Here are some more porous layers that water is flowing through the well through the packing material and into the well screen. So the screen, you can see that this is slotted rather than being like drill holes. It's slotted to keep a smaller diameter, um, but still have a pretty high flow rate. The filter pack itself is usually coarse sand or fine gravel. It's going to need to be coarser than the screen so it doesn't get sucked into the well, but it works to effectively increase the diameter that the well is drawing from because that filter pack is the full, uh, you know, it's, it's, the, the, uh, it's the ring around the well with the diameter of the outer casing of the drilling method. So that can be pretty big. <clears throat> and it's important that that is a uh, non-reactive material that doesn't degrade through time like silica. Water well development means cleaning out the well as you know either during the drilling process or at various points in the into the future. One of the methods for doing that is called surging. So basically putting something in where you're going to pressurize like jamming down, pulling out. So like kind of like with a piston, you're you're surging with pressure up and down and then that is cleaning. There's other techniques for doing that as well using air as another way of pressurizing rather than just pre using uh, a slug or something like that. Uh, when I buy slug, I mean a big metal object. Water well protection is really important. 
the community that I, I live in had insufficient protection and so pollution is getting in around the well casing. Those laws have changed you know, fairly recently so that you, know, you really need to um, put quite a deep seal to prevent, prevent contamination from getting in. And it's not just getting in from the surface, but even um, if your seal is only even say 50 feet, but you have contamination at a hundred foot level, and then it gets into either the gravel pack or other goes down the outside of the casing to a screen, might be a couple hundred feet lower than that, but you're creating a preferential pathway. <clears throat> okay, so that's just a quick overview of the process of wells. We will be looking more at this, but that just hits the highlights. I know this has been a long video podcast, but we've covered a lot of technologies for how to dig holes into the ground or drill holes, and then once you have the hole, some basics about analyzing the material, which would go hand in hand with the attributes that I covered in the surface sediment characterization uh, presentation, and then also how to turn this into a well using uh, like a PVC pipe or steel pipe and then putting the appropriate filter pack and bentonite materials around that.